how are you feeling? It's hard to go back there. But I think it's important that we watch it today. Because it will show us how far we have come. You can see the face of fear. Yes, I can see you're scared. I had no idea what was about to happen. I didn't know the war. I didn't know the battle we were going to have to fight. Please. You do remember the first time that oh. you brought me here? Oh, yeah. Wow. Watch out for the iguana. <laughs> <laughs> you scared me. <laughs> I like took a picture of this place with the kids. And I remember that day like it was yesterday. It was the end of November in 1998. And when I walked in the house, there she was. And I was like, wow, who's this girl? I fell in love with her almost immediately. She was adventurous and she was free. And I feel safe. I feel really safe with him. I feel safe sharing my story, my heart. And that was new for me. How long I knew that we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. And I, I had loved him. I had never met someone like her, and I have never met someone like her since. What I sensed in my heart that I needed to do was to leave everything behind and risk it all and move to Miami. We're gonna get the oceanfront condo and the convertible and I'm gonna get the girl and things are going to be well. Well, we were looking for a feature with my dad. I think I have some of those. Um, Oh, but this is me when I was little. Look at those chubby cheeks. <laughs> Here's this is my grandfather, my grandma, with my dad. These are my parents at the ranch. I, I was born and raised in Colombia. My parents got a divorce when I was very young, four or five years of age. My mom took my sister and I, and we went to live with my, with my grandma. I lived a life of scarcity. We had to ask permission to eat. My contact with my dad was very occasional. All he did was work. And I didn't get to experience a dad in the way that, that any boy longs to experience a dad. He was never affectionate towards me. He never um, gave me any words of love, of affection. I'm in my mid-40s today, and he's never said, I love you to me, not a single time. He began to drink a lot. And all the rage came out in aggression, physical aggression to my mom, emotional aggression to my mom. I remember her describing um, putting herself between all of those threats and me and my sister, and, and she would be willing to take the heat uh, on our behalf. 
my dad would come and show up with his girlfriend. Um, I know that there was a lot of infidelity in their marriage. I wanted to be a completely different man. I wanted to make sure that whenever I had the chance to marry someone, my life would be different. That I would not treat a woman in the way that I saw my dad treat my mom. My feeling towards my dad was apprehension and fear. He was never violent towards me, but I knew that emotionally with a couple of phrases, he could like shut my heart down. I remember coming back home and my mom would ask me, what happened to you? My answer to her is, I don't know, I just feel like someone cut off my, my arms. That was my description of my experience with him. No one was teaching me how to fight or how to hunt or camp, nothing. My friends were sharing about how their dad had taken them to this place and to that place. And if I, people knew that I don't have those skills, that I don't know how to do these things, they're going to mock me, they're going to realize who I truly am and I won't be able to be part of the group. There's something fundamentally wrong with me and so I would try to avoid all the areas where I felt challenged and then be super nice and, and to avoid confrontation, to avoid conflict. I remember the fights among some of them. There's a fight, go. And I remember the, like, the curiosity in seeing my friends fight, going, getting to a fist fight, 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 fight. But at the same time, the fear that what if, so, if I have to get into that spot? And I never did. I was great at avoiding those conflicts and navigating myself out of trouble by being nice, by being a, a super nice guy, a, a yes man, trying to please everyone. I came to believe that I'm passive, I'm just a passive, weak man. I've come to understand that in a man's journey, when he has wounds or brokenness along the way, those wounds create um, a unmet question. Do I really have what it takes? Do I belong? Do I have a place in this world? And then one day I walk into my classroom in the morning and they were trading pornography magazines. I, I got hooked. Wow, what is this? And it felt dangerous, it felt adventurous. And I felt for a moment, wow, I felt like a man. I felt like a real man for a second. Every time that I felt inadequate, every time that I didn't feel like a true man, every time that I was facing a challenge that I didn't think I could overcome, I would instead go to porn. Uh, and that continued then for years. It continued increasing all throughout school and college. The power of being accepted by the beauty is, is tremendous. And when men take that question of, do I have what it takes? Do, do you find me powerful? Do you think I'm a man? It never fully gets answered. The incredible draw that pornography tends to offer is this sense of this gorgeous woman on a page that requires nothing of you, but is projecting absolute acceptance that's conveying in her eyes, you have what it takes and I desperately want you. That message in that image uh, is very powerful. We can get a temporary feeling of capability, but then it's, I need to do it again in order to feel that. There's no lasting presence to the answer. I have this, this undercurrent of shame and fear that is pulling me in the direction of pornography and in the direction of now going to the girl that I'm dating and trying to see if she would tell me that I am amazing. Because if she does, if she turns to me in the middle of the party and we are dancing and this beautiful girl turns to me and looks at me, there's something that feels on the inside, wow, maybe I am the real deal.
Tómense la mano derecha, por favor. Por favor, Pablo, repite estas palabras. Yo, Pablo Alfonso Pardo Merizalde. Yo, Pablo Alfonso Serán Merizalde. Te tomo Juanita Aguilar Pardo. Te tomo Juanita Aguilar Pardo. So when I was a teenager, I was very shy and insecure. Ante las autoridades civiles. One of the things that my dad spoke over me many, many times was that I was stupid, that I was dumb, that I had nothing to offer, that I was worthless. And I feel worthless. Ya los felicitaron todos, nos han dado abrazos, nos han dado bendiciones. Ahora nosotros dos queremos brindar por todos ustedes por estar aquí con nosotros. When I met Pablo, it was totally different. He made me feel desired and wanted. And that was me. I met Pablo um, in Miami. I was 19 and I had just graduated from high school. When Pablo and I got married, and even before we got married, we used to talk about how we know the future. How do we envision ourselves in the next years? We had this vision of living in close to the beach, uh, having an apartment. At the beginning of our marriage, we struggled a lot financially, a lot. I believe that because he really wanted to provide and was afraid of not being able to play the role that he wanted to play, he was really focusing, I need to get a good job. I need to get a job. I want to make money. I was trying to now start my own company and build a, uh, uh, build a business and things were not going well at all. And the financial pressure began to hit us and we didn't have enough to pay the bills. Moments we didn't have food to eat, we got eviction notice in our door, our car got, got repossessed. I want to be the husband that I have in my mind, being able to have a nice home and, and provide for her, for her to be well. Clearly right now, I'm in a position where I re I'm realizing none of that is true. I don't have what it takes to provide for her. When we enter into adulthood, we end up taking that question of do I have what it takes to our career? There's this desire to prove yourself. I must chart my path. I must show that I'm successful. When I look back at when I met Pablo, here was this 20-ish young man who was um, trying to find his way in the world. You know, a newlywed, had his young bride that had the pressures of providing for, and all the stressors there. Um, it was just fertile ground for any of his woundedness to materialize. I remember the feeling of inadequacy that I grew up with beginning to surface again. I began to feel the pull to go back to those places where I had felt like a man in the past. And finally, Pablo got a job um, in real estate. He began to travel. He was getting a really big paycheck. I started spending a lot of time away from home, which pulled me apart from Juanita. We began to distance ourselves a lot. And what was initially just distance became conflict. So I would come back to Miami and see Juanita just for a few days before I had to travel again for business. And I was invited to parties and cocktails. And now I was the one hosting people. Now the drinks were on me. Now I was the center of the party. And so I would tell her, come with me. Let's, we have this party to attend or this cocktail reception to attend. And she, she, I remember her reply was, uh, no, don't, I don't want to go. I am not interested. I didn't want to become somebody else to fit in that lifestyle. And that's what, that was what I was fearing. I was scared. I just wanted us to 
be in our hut on the beach. I saw something in Pablo that I never saw before. And he was unapproachable. I'm on my own and I felt abandoned and I felt that she was not there for me. The distance grew even larger and she felt lonelier. And then the parties continued and the consumption of alcohol increased. And little by little, I was opening the door for more and more hurt and more and more pain. The pornography continued and it was more intensified now because I was lonelier. It became the smile from the girl who is at the cocktail reception in this country abroad that is telling me with her eyes that I'm the real deal. And that combined with alcohol and with loneliness and with the sense of validation, as long as I continue performing and continue being the center of the party, led to me waking one morning, hangover, in a different country, and realizing that next to me was a woman who was not my wife. I was in my apartment alone, but I knew that Pablo had been with somebody else. I don't know how, but I knew. He was out of town when I called him. I said, I knew you were with somebody else. On that phone call, I denied it. I made something up and rushed to hang up and sat down with the reality of what I had done. And I realized in that split second that I had lost every blessing that God had given me. And I had destroyed everything that had brought me true joy and peace into my heart. When I finally came back to Miami, I couldn't avoid her anymore. I couldn't keep it from her. I shared what happened and I saw her heart sink. She grabbed her wedding ring and took it off her finger and threw it on my face and screamed at me and cried and asked me to leave. My heart was broken into pieces and I couldn't believe this is, this is not how our story ends. It cannot be. This is not how it ends. I hate it the man that I had become. Um, and I hated that it had been exposed. My worst fears had come true. Found myself in this empty apartment, um, sleeping on an inflatable mattress, because everything that I had tried with all my strength to get was gone. Looking back into the story of my dad, I was repeating the story. 
as much as I had criticized him and disliked his life, I was becoming a man like him. When months began to pass and there wasn't any sign of power, no, I began to doubt, you know, what are we doing? What am I doing? By then, Juanita and I had been living in separate places. I was avoiding having to talk to her about what had happened and what I had done. I was in this place of loneliness and depression and heartache, but I was paralyzed by fear. Am I supposed to be here waiting? Should I move on? He wasn't coming back to fight for me or to try to work things out. I called him one day and I said, Maybe the best thing was to get a divorce. Instead of trying to stop her and convince her, and no, tell her we can do something about it. Wait a second, this is a horrible mistake. I told her that I would respect her decision. The reality is I was not doing anything about it out of fear and shame. I didn't know how to change things. I didn't know how to fight for us. I didn't, I didn't know. And I was afraid that if I tried, I would fail. I thought that I had found the path to a better life. And then working hard and providing and traveling and living this life was going to be better for me and ultimately for her. and it, had, it didn't work for me. I was before my eyes losing the most important person in my life and I wasn't doing anything about it. And that confirmed something that I had believed in the past. I'm not worth fighting for. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't see me. I was on a trip and I was at the gateway to get on a plane and I lost it. I began to cry and I remember feeling, feeling again. I miss her. I would like for her to be close to me. I miss what we had. I remember the day that Pablo came to me at my office, and I could tell something was up, that there was something very heavy on his heart. There was something different in my, in my face, and, and Jim saw it. And so he asked me, are you okay? And tears began to run down my face, and I said to him, Juanita and I are going to get a divorce. And he said, was their infidelity. And just right away, I had a sense of the full story. I can't tell you why I understood it so well, um, probably through my own brokenness, but I knew that the, 
there was a, a component of unfaithfulness, and I just flat out asked him. And I told him yes. It was a horrible misstep, and I could just tell it had devastated him and could only imagine how devastated Juanita was. I think there was a desperation, a, uh, a sense that all had been lost. He sat me on the chair, he said, sit down. And then he said, we can get through this. I believe that you have what it takes to fight to regain the ground that was lost. Yes, you did something wrong. And yes, you're going to have the f to face the consequences of that, but you can. Let me show you how. There's a journey that I want to show to you. There's a path that you can take. Would you let me show it to you? And he gave me the book, While at Heart. I needed to go back and understand how my story had shaped me. It started with the, the understanding that the man that I had become was in great part the result of my story. I had not received, as a boy, what my heart needed from a father, I had, hadn't been properly loved. I had not been validated, and I had not been initiated. If the man that I had become was the result of the wounds that I had received, the message of, that came with those wounds, and then the decisions that I made to make life work, then could it be possible that at the depths of my soul, I had been created as a different man than the man that I had become. I became a Christian when I was eight years old. And all of this was new to me. Maybe there is more to me than simply me being a weak, passive, checked out man. I have come to believe those things because someone wanted to harm me because evil had come against me through the wounds that I received in my childhood. So as I began to see life through those lenses, my heart began to awake again. And yes, I was fully responsible for my actions, but I had fallen into a trap. It was understanding that I had an enemy and my enemy was not my wife. My soul was longing for something, and my enemy was placing before me a counterfeit. And, and it was to begin understanding that the passions and the desires that I felt were actually good. That I was created in the, Im in the image of a God who loved those things, and adventure, and passion, and freedom, who wanted good things for me. But there is an enemy who is trying to kill, and to steal, and to destroy my heart, my life, my marriage, my wife's heart and he's done a pretty successful job so far. That created a fire in my heart in order to fight for her and fight for us. I needed to recover my heart first. Around that time, I met this man who invited me to train Muay Thai with him. My immediate reaction was, Muay Thai? I don't know. I had never gotten into a fight in my entire life. I'm the nicest guy in the world, after all. I needed to risk. I needed to move in the opposite direction that I would have moved traditionally. And so I accepted. All right, so what I 
thought from just like a striking perspective tonight. One of the things that we see all the time is that your story shows up on the map. Whether you're super defensive over stuff, you'll have a defensive posture there. If you're overly aggressive and overreacting in certain ways, it'll show up there. On the flip side, the things that you learn on the mat also show up in your story. So what you fix on the mat, many times you see being fixed in the rest of your life as well. I remember being cornered and shying away from his punches. And he would say, come on, face me. Don't turn around. You can do this. Don't avoid confrontation. Don't avoid conflict. You have a strength. You can do this. It was a perfect picture of my life. Engaging in something, engaging in a challenge, but very quickly moving away from it, hiding from it, because I didn't feel that I was capable of handling my life. That's what exactly what my heart needed. It was God himself inviting me to be trained as a warrior. But if it is true that I am a warrior, if it is true that I am God's son, if it is true that I can be more than that weak and passive man that I thought I was, then I could choose differently. And my heart began to swell with strength. And that led me to confirm, oh, this is who I am. This is who I am. I can do this. And if I was able to do this, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can take greater risks until I was ready to take the biggest risk of all and to reach out to her again. One day, he called me and said, I need a ride to the airport. Would you be willing to take me? There was something in his voice that was different and more him. We're in the car at the same time, and I said something, and I made her laugh. And with her smile, I knew in my heart, not all is lost. Something happened to him. I didn't know what it was, but I began to feel like us again in the car as I was taking him to the airport. That same day when he arrived at his destination, he called me. And I remember the butterflies. I was more nervous than when I first met her. I asked her for forgiveness, not only for what I had done, but for my passivity, for my lack of engagement. She then, right there, she confessed to me that she had forgiven me for what I had done right away. In her beautiful heart, she had seen through all the crap. She knew who I was more than I did. And I was wrestling with the question, Will I be willing to risk and go back? I didn't want my heart to be broken again like that. What if this is the beginning of something new with the man that I have in front of me, who is not the man that I experienced in the past? And I felt like risking was the right answer. He was entering into a battle to fight for our marriage and with the intention to win.
Who's Who's this guy? Me. Nuki. That was Mateo. How old was that? You were less than a year? You no, because year? he's walking, so he's probably 14 months, like a year and two months. I'm big. So that's that house close to the hotel that I showed you. I'm big for a baby. Yeah. Fighting for her means that in conflict, I'm not the one who needs to fight to be right. I am the one who needs to fight to restore union. And then as one, we can both search for truth. I have come to understand that I don't see things as they are. I see things as I am, as a result of my journey, and she does too. The next months and years were not easy at all. We had to sit down and go through the story again and go through forgiveness. As we experience restoration, I regain her trust over time. It's been a beautiful journey. It's been hard, but beautiful at the same time. We cannot fix each other, and trying to fix each other is not going to work, but more, how can we become each other's best advocates? And we had our first son, Mateo, who is now 10, in Miami, Florida. You guys having fun? We're having a blast right here. <laughs> and later, our son, Lucas, who was born in Colorado a month after we had moved there. My kids know they're loved by their dad. They know that. It's completely the opposite of what Pablo had as a father. The way Pablo engages with our boys. I see their eyes every time that I speak the truth of who they are. This is the house. That they have what it takes. That there is nothing that they need to prove to earn my love. Do you remember why we're why we're going to Florida? Yeah. Why? So you two can renew their, your vows. It means when two people get married, mm -hmm. um, they promise that they'll stay together forever. Mm -hmm. But but a vow means that they promise to each other, but they also promise to God. That's okay. right. Yeah. Like Number it's one. like getting married again. What happens at the end? You remember? No. I hope that he says, now you may kiss the bride, and so I'm oh. going to give your mama a big wet kiss. Like you do every day. Like I do every day. Against all odds, we're going to be celebrating our 20th uh, wedding anniversary next week. Coming back to Miami, it's a reminder of my journey, our journey, and it's a reason to celebrate what God has done all these 20 years.
we get to do a lot of date nights with Pablo and Juanita. One of the things I really admire about their marriage is how transparent they are and how, um, I guess, humble and vulnerable they let us in. And they talk about real things. When they enter our home, like the atmosphere shifts. Like they bring so much joy, so much life. Where someone's greatest glory lies is where the greatest assault has been. That's it. That's it. Pablo's been a great example of how to dig into some of the deeper issues that us men go through. They've modeled the ability to repair a uh, broken relationship. <laughs> it didn't work out. I, was... I got to see Pablo's journey, you know, uh, up close. And any impact I had in Pablo's life came from my own brokenness. That's a fact. Like, like it's part of a... Pablo's marriage is one of the more stunning turnabouts because that's where rock bottom occurred and to see the playfulness and the joyfulness in their marriage um, how they work through the battles that they're confronted with the the challenges that every marriage uh, faces is startling The idea that they would have their 20th year wedding anniversary and renew their vows at a, 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 a good friend of mine's place in Key Largo um, was just a beautiful setting. I am in awe that I have the marriage that I have and the family that I have. I don't understand it. I don't deserve it. And I could never have put this back together in my, on my own. What kind of man do I want to be as I go to work tomorrow? What kind of man do I want to be as I engage my wife when I see her this afternoon? What kind of man do I want to be when my children are running to me? Do I want to be the checked out, passive, weak man? No, I want to be the source of love for them. I want to love them like they have never felt loved before. I love you so much. Shall we? Yeah, we shall. Mm. I see it. Oh. My princess, 20 years ago, I was overflowing with love as I gave myself in marriage to you. Our marriage was tested. But because of the strength of God's love, His relentless pursuit of our hearts and our willingness to say yes to Him and fight for each other's hearts. We are here today with our beautiful family and friends celebrating 20 years of the most wild and beautiful adventure. 
today, as we enter into a new season as husband and wife, again, I will continue fighting for us so that we can experience the fullness of what God has made available between you and me on this side of heaven. I love you so much. I love you with all my heart. And I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with you, my love. All the blessings that I'm experiencing today are nothing short of a miracle. I wouldn't like to live anyone else's life. We have all kinds of troubles and, and things that come up like any other person, but we live a life of peace. And the journey that has taken us here was worth taking. Every single step, every single tear, every drop, of blood was worth it. To wake up next to my bride, my princess every, every morning, for the last 20 years, that almost didn't happen. Hitting rock bottom was what we needed to be able to go up to the surface to see the transformation of my husband 20 years ago to the man that he is today. It's mind-blowing. And I can fall in love with him again and again and again. And it's true. The power of love about all else wins out. It sounds a little fairy tale-ish, you know? But the story of Pablo and Juanita really models it. At each of their chapters, it was the power of love that won out. I have learned the fierceness of the warrior is rooted in love. the love that I have received from my God and in the love that I have for myself and for my wife and for my children and for the people that I love. I will fight for them. Our kids are watching us. They're watching our marriage. They're learning from us. And what are we teaching them? I will not allow the enemy to steal another second or another inch from me. When I look back into the story, now I understand why the enemy was so fierce against us. Because love is the most powerful force in the universe. And he wanted to stop that power from living in my home and through my home into the people that we love. It's the love of God.